So when I get home from work, I usually just empty my pockets onto my dresser. So what I thought I'd do is make a small tray that can hold all this stuff and keep it organized. So here's the collection of tools I used to make this project. Starting on the right hand side, just a real simple ruler. This one happens to be 12 inches stainless steel with a cork back. I think I got this from Ocean State Job Lot for like a dollar. I used a ballpoint pen to draw my cutting lines. I prefer using pen over pencil oftentimes because the line is easier to see. Here's a combination square I got from Harbor Freight, just a couple bucks. A pair of scissors I've owned forever. A scrap piece of particle board. I just use this as a sanding block when using my sandpaper. For this project, I used 150 grit, but I could have used 220. Uh, 150 is what I had most handy, so that's what I used. I also use this razor knife. I'm sure you've seen these before. These are very versatile knives. I think I paid 50 cents at Harbor Freight for this one. What's really nice about these, just in case you haven't seen them, is that you can advance the blade quite far and, and do your cutting with the blade extended like that. Just be careful because the blade is somewhat flexible. If you retract the blade and make it shorter, now it's quite a bit stiffer. Once you get the blade to the length that you want, then you can pull this little tab back. It's like a locking tab. And that makes it uh, impossible to advance or retract the blade it just won't move so that's nice when you're ready to move the blade again just push that tab in and now you could advance or retract the blade and then finally when this part of the blade the corner gets dull you can take a regular pair of pliers and snap off that section of the blade and that reveals a new sharp section of the blade with a new sharp corner right there. So that's nice. So when the blade gets dull, you don't have to replace the whole blade. You just snap off the bit that's dull and keep moving. For a glue gun, I'm using one made by Stanley. It's 80 watts. There's two temperature settings. I always use the high temperature setting. For the glue gun, of course, you need glue sticks. I think I got these at Walmart. Very inexpensive. They're available everywhere, including online. Right on the back of the package, it describes these as all-purpose clear glue sticks. And it says that you can use them on either high or low temperature settings. Here's what the glue sticks look like out of the package. Half inch in diameter, round, very flexible. If you've never tried hot melt glue, I recommend you try it. Just be careful because the glue does get hot. Uh, I also used a self-healing cutting mat. I've had this for years, except you really wouldn't know it. And then right below the, the, um, the cutting mat, I just have a scrap piece of particle board. This helps me to elevate the cutting mat when I'm cutting some cardboard using the combination square. I'll try and show you a little bit more about what I mean in a minute. So I think that's, I think I've covered everything. So hopefully my message is very clear. With a very limited set of tools, some corrugated cardboard and some chipboard, you can make some really awesome projects, including the one I'm gonna show you today. So there's lots of different places you can get corrugated cardboard, uh, oftentimes for free. This happens to be an old Amazon box, and all I did was cut along the um, seams to cut it into panels. Now the issue with this kind of cardboard is they always use some kind of a tape to keep the box closed during shipping. So you want to take as much of that tape off as you can. The other thing is that this kind of cardboard tends to be very thin. 
So if you want to make a thicker sheet or a sheet that's stiffer, you're going to have to layer a bunch of these pieces together, you know, glue them together into one sheet, which is easy enough to do. It's just a little bit more work. Now, another kind of box that's pretty good to use is the kind of box that kids' diapers come in. And the reason this is a good box to use is because it is thicker. If you contrast that with, say, your typical small Amazon box, hopefully you can see that the diaper box is substantially thicker. So I would prefer this cardboard over this cardboard when making anything of significant size or if I wanted uh, to make something that would hold a significant amount of weight because this is not going to support as much as this. Now the downside with this kind of a box and maybe you can see is that it has a shiny reflective plasticky kind of label on the outside of the box and glue won't stick to this at least not hot glue which is what I tend to use when making stuff out of corrugated cardboard so if you wanted to glue to this side of the box you're going to have to peel this label off which is easy enough to do it's just more work that's all now another kind of box corrugated cardboard box that perhaps is my favorite is this is kind of a large box it's kind of hard to get into the frame but this is a flat screen TV box this happens to be a Sony LED 40 inch flat screen TV and the reason I like this kind of cardboard is that it's thicker and therefore stiffer and it's already made in layers. So you can hopefully you can see there that I would call this one and a half layers. There's kind of a thick layer right here and then another layer that's I'm going to call it half as thick stuck to it. So I like using this kind of cardboard because it's very stiff and therefore makes strong projects. Now the other thing that's nice about this particular box is that there is no shiny label on the outside of the box. So there's no label I have to peel off. There is, however, some packing tape, which you think you can see, hopefully. And I would have to peel this off because hot glue won't stick to the packing tape. So my message here is that coordinated cardboard is everywhere. And oftentimes it's free. So that's just one of the many reasons I like working with corrugated cardboard. Another kind of cardboard that I enjoy using is called chipboard. Now I actually bought this chipboard in a package off of Amazon. I bought, I bought it off of Amazon because these pieces are fairly thick and that's what I was looking for. I think the package I bought had 20, 25 pieces in it. Don't remember exactly, that's why I'll leave uh, a link in the video description so you can see. So you've probably run across chipboard many times and really just maybe never noticed it. Oftentimes chipboard is used as the backing piece on notebooks and notepads. So one of the things that I like to do with chipboard 
let's say I'm working on a project and I've got some corrugated cardboard all layered up and of course they'd all be glued together this happens to be five layers of, a, of three different thicknesses it looks like so if this was the exposed edge on my project well that doesn't look very nice it's also really not paintable what you could do is take some chipboard and glue it on to the edge and now you have a nice flat consistent smooth surface which then you can paint to finish off your project so i like to use corrugated cardboard in combination with chipboard because it just gives me infinite possibilities with very very inexpensive materials so now I'd like to just take a quick minute to try and explain why I use this piece of particle board underneath my cutting mat to raise the whole mat up a little bit when using my combination square. Let's say I got this piece of cardboard and it's already got an angle cut on it like this. And I don't want this angle. I want a nice 90 degree angle. So the way to do that is, as long as this edge is nice and straight, I could take my combination square, line it up like this on my cardboard, and then when I make a cut right there, I'm going to get a nice 90 degree angle. Okay, so the way I would set that up, I'm going to kind of exaggerate it so it's easier to see on the camera. I've got my cardboard, I have my straight edge, take my combination square, I'm going to put it in position on the cardboard where I want to actually make my cut. In some instances, I'll actually take my pen and draw a cut line there also, just so I can keep track of what I'm doing. But for this example, I won't, I won't bother with that. Okay, so now the, the cardboard is pushed up against the combination square. So now if I slide the combination square and the cardboard down, okay, now it's in, in, in contact with the cutting mat. So now if I slide all three of those things down and hold everything in place, now I can go ahead and make my cut. I do several passes. The first pass just scores through the top layer, and then I make several other passes. I find it's better to make the cut in several passes. You wind up with a much cleaner cut that way. And there you go. So now I have a nice right angle. I just find it's a little bit easier to do this with the cutting mat raised up off of my main table surface a little bit. And I just use a piece of scrap uh, particle board to do that with. Hopefully that makes sense.
So I'm going to call this box done for now. It's very strong. It doesn't twist or bend or flex at all. So I wanted to call your attention to that and remind you that this is just made from corrugated cardboard and chipboard all held together with hot melt glue. So the materials were very inexpensive and yet I'm able to construct something that's very rigid and also very lightweight. So like I said, I'm going to call this box done for now. Uh, the next step would be to apply a finish. I'm not sure I'm going to do that, but perhaps at some point. In order to do that, what I would probably do is get some spackle and fill in some of the gaps. There's one right there. There's some right here. Fill in some of the gaps, maybe glue up some of the tear out. Give the whole thing a light sanding, prime it, and then paint it. But for this video, I'm going to call this box done for now. Next up, a quick test run.